we still have a significant number uh, more people who have registered than are here yet, but we also have a lot of excellent content to cover today. So I'm going to kick things off unless there's a major objection from, from the room. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Ben Underwood. I know most of you. I'd like to know all of you. Uh, I'm serving as chapter president this year for the Western North Carolina chapter of AFP. Um, thanks for being here today. This is going to be a great presentation from Hirista. Um, Ann and Kathy are, are, have got some great material to talk to us about donor relations and more, more about that in a moment. I want to just pause for a second and, and mention a few things. Um, your membership is incredibly important to the chapter. This year, uh, more than others, as the normal activities of, of a lot of our jobs and of, of certainly of our chapter are disrupted and adapting. Um, all of us remaining stalwart and, and active members is incredibly important. And I say that knowing full well what a challenge it is to, to fit AFP into a busy life that is now remote is indeed a challenge, but it means a lot to the chapter. It means a lot to your colleagues to have one another in this network where we can support each other. There are some more opportunities on the horizon for members to connect um, and some members only um, opportunities on that front so that we can continue to be connected as a chapter even though we can't be together in person yet. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. Uh, 2021 sponsors are, are coming online and I just wanna take a moment to continue to acknowledge our 2020 sponsors who stuck with us during a very difficult year. They include UNC Asheville, the Community Foundation of Western North Carolina, and First Citizens Bank. So thanks very much to, to those groups who understand the value of investing in our professional association, which has then an amplified effect on all the organizations and institutions that we serve. Um, our, we couldn't do this without your membership and without our sponsors. So thank, thanks very much to everyone. And with that, I'll turn the, the reins over to Kelly Shannonfelt, who's going to introduce our speakers today. Take it away, Kelly. Thank you. All right, I have the pleasure today of introducing Ann Manor McClarty and Kathy Jackson from Harista. Ann Manor McClarty is the lead strategist for the donor recognition firm Harista and managing editor of the Journal of Donor Relations and Stewardship. She founded Harista in 2011 to address the growing complexities of donor relations and stewardship. She and her team work with nonprofits to develop authentic, sustainable programs that help realize nonprofits' missions by engaging and motivating donors. Kathy Jackson's career has taken her from public libraries to municipalities and corporate America, then to nonprofits, including museums and theaters. Her roles have varied from research librarian to competitive intelligence researcher to development. Relationships with philanthropists throughout her career have given her a unique perspective on the nuances between an organization's mission, successful storytelling, and donor relationships. She is excited to share her talents and insight into donor relations with our constituency. And I'll also go ahead and tell you that there is going to be a pretty extensive Q&A period on this program. So once that gets started, I'm going to ask everyone to unmute. You can remute yourself if you're more comfortable with that. You can also use the raise your hand, which you can find um, either under reactions or participants, depending on your version of Zoom. So you can raise your hand if you have a question and we'll try to call on you. Otherwise, just leave yourself unmuted and speak up as you have a question or as you have a comment. So thank you. And with that, I will turn things over to Ann. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I wanted to also mention that Wendy Lou Billings is on the phone with us, and I know several of you know her as well. Um, Kelly, um, I'm not Kelly, Kelly, we'll hire you soon. Wendy Lou <laughs> and Kathy and I have all been working together uh, for about a year. Kathy joined us in April of 2020, which was notable. Um, Wendy Lou has been with us coming up on three years, be three years this summer. So Heurista is a consulting firm that is most known for its donor recognition. So we do in fact design built environments. Um, we call that philanthropic placemaking, but we also work with organizations to develop all sorts of donor relations strategies. And so 2020 has been an amazing year for us to pivot towards digital. We do have a digital product that we're working with now, but also to strategize what even matters, if you will, uh, in this circumstance as far as traditional donor relations? Is it all about just making calls and keeping people connected? Or do we need to be building some sort of strategy for how we're gonna move forward with you know, what donor relations looks like in the future, what donor recognition looks like in the future, 
you know, a lot of organizations right now won't spend money on recognition because they feel that they need to be investing in mission. And we fully understand that and respect that. So in um, March, well, it was really a little early, like March 16th, really, really early. I got a call from uh, Her uh, Henry Caruth at 1157. I don't know if any of you know him, but he's also here in the North Carolina area. And he said, oh, Ann, what are we going to do? Like, we need to be talking to our clients, just like we're telling our clients to talk to their donors to figure out what the next, you know, at that point we thought was several months was going to mean for folks. So we decided we would uh, conduct an actual survey and we ran a survey. The um, records for it are all available at thankingdonors.net which we'll be sending out quite a few references at the end of the session. So don't worry about taking notes. You'll be able to get the report and everything there. But what we were, our goal in doing so was twofold. One, to find out what did our clients need and want and what were they facing? Who was at home? Who was doing what? Who knew what would come next? But also what did they anticipate wanting? And at first there was a lot of anxiety about how would people respond to a couple of donor recognition firms sending out a survey like that? Would it seem um, out of place? Would it seem awkward with people first going on furlough? So we were very clear up front with what our goals were. And it's very much what Ben was just saying about AFP. The goal was just to connect with people, make sure they were okay, let them know that there was a forum where they could talk about what their experience was and where they would have an ongoing opportunity to say, hey, I need help with this, or I need help with that. So over the course of 2020, that exercise um, grew. Um, we had other uh, organizations come on board and help sponsor the um, survey itself, including the Association of Donor Relations Professionals. And then we later ended up running a specific survey to the Canadian environment, because there's some differences in the way furloughs and nonprofit relations and everything else works in the Canadian environment. So this has been an ongoing process and we even to some degree continued it with all of you by asking some of you to participate in a survey which we can continue after today's conversation as well. Because I think helping people see what their peers are going through helps us all process where we are and what we're gonna do next. So that's sort of the, the goal of, of what we're up to um, our original survey is what I'm going to be reporting on today, but I'm also going to be asking you all to help us either through chat or through conversation, sort of bring this whole conversation local, because if it helps to, you know, if you're in, a, you're a food bank, sure, it helps to talk to another food bank, but sometimes it helps to talk to the nonprofit next door to really understand what's happening in your local community. So that's what I'm hoping we can do today is to you know, build a network around some of these issues, figure out what's going on for us as a, as a community and figure out where, where we individually and as a group think we're going next. So the original survey was, as I said, conducted in March, 2020. We sent out 93 invitations, which came just from Heurista's client list and 1157's client list. That's where we got started. Let's just talk to the people we know we had 36 responses, which we thought, given that you know March 2020 was meltdown month, uh, was was pretty good. And we found that people were really quite interested in talking to us about what they what was going on with them. So the key findings that we came out of this, there are five of them, and you'll hear me sort of repeat some of these topics over and over. One is what a dramatic variety there was in personal experiences. Um, one would assume that you know, it was, we're all in nonprofits, it must have been similar for everyone, but that was not at all the case. There were people where everyone on their team was instantly furloughed. There were places where there were no furloughs. There were places where you weren't furloughed, but suddenly the executive director of a hospital foundation is being asked to run the daycare center for hospital employees because there's nowhere for those people to take their children to daycare. So the experiences were wildly different. Postponements and cancellations. If you think about what the time period was there, that was what happened first was everybody had to just put everything on stop. The role of technology was kicking in. For the most part, nonprofits seemed especially well suited to uh, a pivot to work from home. And I think in large part, that's because our fundraisers were already often on the road. And so we had the infrastructure in place 
for people to VPN to local networks, you know, things like that. We weren't used to being all of us all sitting nine to five in the same physical space. So we did fairly well on that front. But as the months went by, what technology was going to sustain not just the teamwork, but interaction and engagement of donors became a bigger topic. Um, work from home, for the most part, in the full, you know, almost a year now we've been running this, almost across the board, we hear that work from home has been more successful than anyone would have anticipated. And I, I, you know, I think that is something we should both celebrate and then question what's that going to look like as we move forward? Are we going to be taking uh, more what they call hybrid work environments where some people are in the office, some people are not. What is the group dynamic of that when we get to that on scale? Um, me personally, I've always worked from home to some degree. I missed my team so badly when they went home. I flopped around like a fish. I was so out of place without my friends and it didn't matter that I saw them every morning on Zoom and I could call them anytime I wanted. I really pouted as a leader about not having my team all in one physical space. And that's been a huge thing for me to adjust to. And I know other people that were like that, including some you know, leaders of big teams, um, you know, folks at universities who say, I just can't foresee tolerating the work from home as a permanent component for my team because it, we pulled it off, but we're not growing. So that's something I'd like for us to touch on a little bit today. And then the biggest piece that we came up in March was that although we asked in March of 2020, only 17% of the people said they didn't know what would come next. So as a group, nonprofits were pretty good at saying, this is what we're gonna do. This is what we're gonna do next. This is what we're gonna continue to do. And I think it's because we're so mission focused. We all have a mission. We can all repeat our mission. We know what we're going to do. So for us, the pivot was real. It wasn't, we have to create what we're going to do. We were just going to pivot how we were going to achieve what we knew we should already be doing. So that, that was a big topic of the day. Um, as I said for today, my goal is to help this group connect. So I'm going to be ask us to um, talk to one another quite a bit. I'm going to ask moments where I'm going to say, please put something in chat. And that's so Kathy and Wendy Lou and Kelly can help me see what you have to say. And then at one point, we're going to turn everybody's voices back on because I think there's enough of us that we can we can have conversation about this, which is really the goal, the goal of today. So with that, I'm going to um, move into some of what the experiences were from the survey. Our survey, as I said, had 36 initial respondents. And of that, 40% of them were in healthcare, roughly 40% in higher ed and 20% of other nonprofits. And that's typical of our work. That's exactly how my company's work breakdown is. But I'm assuming that today we probably have the inverse. We probably have 80% smaller nonprofits with 20% of this audience works for either higher ed or um, uh, healthcare. So if you all wouldn't mind, could you just chat what your organization name is and your team size, like literally your advancement team, just so we can all start to sort of see who's on the line and, and, and what our makeup is as a group. All right, while you all do that, I'm gonna go on to some of the, the next points about that. So when we did this in March, 30% of the respondents face immediate furloughs. So we were speaking to people that either they or one of their co-workers was immediately furloughed. Um, one of our client teams went from 17 to four instantly. Like that happened the Monday after, see March 16th, it was amazing. Um, how many of you all had furloughs within your team? And are those furloughs uh, now permanent? Like is your team permanently smaller or, or is your team likely uh, either now or in the very near future to be back at size? And Kathy, I'm not gonna open all that up or I'll get distracted by the details. I'm gonna let you take a look at it for us. That's all right. I'm seeing mostly no furloughs. Um, some losses through attrition and again, no furloughs and um, holding some positions open until things change. 
but most of this is no furloughs. I'm seeing some staff cut 20%. Everyone was furloughed at the beginning. So there's some of that. Um, some people are back. Okay. So they're kind of all over the map. And actually, they're, it's interesting to me how few furloughs there were. Yeah, and I think that, that um, the, the all over the map refers to the variety of experience that we saw in our survey group as well. Um, throughout the year, one of the things that we heard was that fundraising teams were being called to do something different than what they normally would, um, including some organizations where either senior leadership or boards would make the decision that it just was not appropriate to be fundraising at this time at all. How many of you were reassigned to some other task and was that other task still within the spectrum of, you know, advancement and development? Did you just move to donor relations, more on the stewardship side than the cultivation side, or were you literally like, as happened to some of our healthcare friends, you know, no, I'm gonna go work the COVID check-in station indefinitely until they, they move me back. Did, did most of this audience stay, you know, pretty much in your same task set pre and post work from home? Okay. Well, that is good to know because that was not necessarily the case in larger organizations. Larger organizations uh, often reassigned staff to other assignments, especially in healthcare. It became a, all hands on deck to make sure basic services were being delivered. So that was that was quite interesting for us to see. So at this point, Kelly, if we could, I'd like to unmute everybody because I'm gonna move from asking our questions in the chat to asking people to give some specific examples. So if, if anyone wants to speak up, we'll take it at any, any point in time. So as I said, there were sort of these um, major topics that we talked about and variety of experience was one of them. The next one was postponements. So 64% saw something instantly postponed. So whether it's the lunches that we normally would go through with AFP, the gala, uh, the golf tournament, like pretty much ever across the board, people saw something postponed. My question of this team is of what was postponed last spring through the end of 2020, what of it are you trying to bring back online in 2021? How are you planning that given that, you know, as we all know, the numbers are still high, but the vaccine is here. It's like this seesaw back and forth of, of decision making. Can anyone speak up and give us an example of what you are planning to bring back on and how you're going about sort of weighing and balancing the varieties? Yes, Jennifer. Hi, I'm Jennifer with the Wortham Center. Um, so postponed for us was every single performing arts event that we had for the season. And we had just uh, kicked off, opened our doors from the Capitol campaign in 1920 in October. So in March, we were shut down and that's 75% of our budget. So we're basically living off of whatever we bring in right now. Um, we have done outdoor performances, social distancing performances. We've shifted, which is our, our new term right now and um, getting a lot of support from the community. We are doing, we usually have a huge yes campaign for our um, students that come to the theater who are um, within the public schools, um, low income students, giving them an opportunity to see live performances. So we're gonna do a virtual auction with that um, come May is what we're planning. So we've done virtual performances, um, some in-house, in-person, but we're, we're just, we're trying to make it work and try to still bring the arts to our community. Mm -hmm. So both a combination of virtual mission delivery and virtual donor engagement. Absolutely. And we get comments all the time from our donors, you know, I'll send them note cards or I'll send them an email and they're like, you know, we, we missed the dance portion and, and, you know, our hearts were just so thrilled to see a Swan and Noah solstice again this December and we didn't think it was going to happen. And Shauna Tucker, people were just so excited and she made sure that it was a zoom so she could interact with the audience. 
And it's just, it's heartwarming. And it's also heartbreaking that we're in this climate right now and, and we're having to do things a lot differently, but it's, um, this is what it's gonna be moving forward, basically. Yeah. So, so as far as donor it's Kathy, engagement. It's Kathy, oh. and can I jump in really quick? Yes, you can, because you know more um, about I just, I have to tell the whole group and, and tell Jennifer, because um, I spent some time at Diana Wortham, um, at the Wortham Center as well. And the creativity that's coming out of that organization is amazing. I never thought that I would have an opportunity to dance with the Ballet Trocadero. And I'm about to do that on your live Zoom thing in a couple of weeks. Yes. And I, I like let out a hoot when I saw the announcement that I actually had the opportunity to dance with those guys. Yeah. So I will be in my living room, <laughs> hopefully all by myself. But the creativity there is amazing and to be commended. Thank you. What an interesting uh, twist to it all because you don't think of the seats in the theater as restrictive, but Kathy could only dance so much in her seat, but she can dance <laughs> a lot more in her living room. How That's fabulous. Right. So Jennifer, before we're done, I wanted to ask you what had to change about how you would get donors lined up behind this? I mean, are you working off past dollars or are you seeking new, new funding to support you know, this change in mission delivery? So we category, we tiered our donors, of course. I just came on board in June. So um, tiering our donors, cultivating them, uh, talking to them, letting them know that we're still here, letting them know that their membership dollars and their donor dollars are still helping us keep afloat and letting them know exactly what their dollars are going for. When we do monthly membership renewals, we look at their past giving history and we ask if maybe they would like to increase to the next level because we still are having performances. It's not quite what the schedule looked like, but we're still bringing stuff to them. And as a member, you can still get these beautiful benefits that we have lined out for them. So we have seen an increase in membership levels. We did an end of the year challenge gift um, and we exceeded that. It was um, $100,000 worth our goal, and we exceeded that for end of year. So it's just uh, talking to donors. I'm, I'm on the phone. I'm probably talking to 15 people a day. So donors from all different levels and different types of, you know, how long they've been with us or if they're just new people. If they've attended a performance, a Shauna Tucker performance, and they've never attended before, I'm emailing them, thanking them for joining us. Or if they're not a friend, but they've been a longtime patron, I'm asking, you know, thank you for being there the first couple of times in emails and, and uh, cultivating and then asking if they would like to join to become a member. Um, so it's just, it's, it's donor engagement and just communication mm -hmm. is the biggest key. So for others of you who don't have um, programs of that sort and membership, are you also finding that it's a lot more one-on-one -on -one conversation with donors? Because that, that has been our experience as well, is um, whether it's Zoom call, which we might all be getting tired of, or the regular old telephone, um, the number of people that you talk to in a, any given period has increased dramatically. Can anyone speak to that, both that decision and then how you're carrying that out and managing it. Anybody got a, a creative way? Do you, do you ever talk to donors together? Um, you know, like almost like small events, some of the organizations are calling it where they'll have like donors get together and have a conversation in any creative approaches to how you're, you're handling that workload. And we, we haven't, done those small groups, but um, we usually have a, a scholarship brunch in October or November to thank our scholarship donors. And um, obviously we couldn't do that this year. And instead we worked with a vendor uh, who, who provides a video platform and we collected video testimonials from students, scholarship recipients. And we were able to, to attach an introductory video to the beginning of those. and did that in place of our traditional event mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and got a good response from that. I mean, people missed gathering and they missed hearing live uh, testimonials, but this was, this was a way um, 
with, I don't know, I wouldn't say it was less expensive than the event, but it, but we could offset the cost a bit by, by not having a live event. And, and that worked pretty well for us. Okay. Um, Anyone in else? In Hendersonville, um, for the Athena, this is not exactly fundraising, but it was, it was to some degree for the Athena luncheon. We did do, we videoed uh, the speaker, which was um, uh, from Highland Brewing. It was Leah Wong and um, had used the hop in platform and probably had 200 people on, you know, a, a lunch time event. And, um, you know, the pre, some of it was pre-filmed, mm -hmm. you know, the speakers and some of the, re, the um, award folks were pre-filmed. So that, I think that works. Um, I think that works okay. And we had sponsors. Um, the other places I'm working, we're doing more of a combination of phone calls and, you know, a lot of online marketing things but no real in-person done or events or anything yet. Okay. So as with this sort of change to the technology differences, I, I do think we're seeing a lot more video. I think one of the benefits of video is that it has a longer lifespan. It's not a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's something that people can watch, maybe watch twice, share with a friend. Um, some of the platforms allow you to then also monitor the, sort of the trajectory of, of that new content that you've shared. Um, do you all have the same measures of success for the new behaviors that you're going through that you would have for event, an event? So I'm gonna simplify, let's say it was the gala, step one, how many people <laughs> are CP? Step two, how many actually show up? Um, are we able to make the connections we had hoped for for leadership and cultivation calls? You know, you had this set of things and some plan out in the future for, you know, let's hope that that results to, a, you know, some not specific amount of income, but we can we can show a dent that. Sorry, a little. Can I, can I just there. jump in? So I'm talking technology and it all disappears. Yes, John, please. Oh, oh yeah, uh, we did we did a couple of things that had kind of an interesting result. One is we set up some Zoom times with our donors and any donor who wanted to uh, join in that Zoom. And then they were not meant to be really large, you know, 50 or 100 people. We don't have that uh, a huge donor base at, at this time. But uh, we were uh, expecting anywhere from five to 10 uh, people would get on. And then after a brief introduction by our board chair and executive director, we just opened it up to a discussion and questions. And the, the people who participated really enjoyed that, really enjoyed that. The other thing is we, we sent out uh, just checking up on you to see if, make sure you're okay, emails to as many uh, of our donors that we had an email for. And that was really interesting because just the checking up emails generated uh, a number of nice donations. They were just so happy that somebody was at least aware of them and that uh, we're all in this together. And uh, the emails were, we didn't ask for any money. We specifically didn't want to make this an appeal, just a checking up. And we told, uh, you know, shared a few stories of the clients that we were serving and uh, it generated some very nice donations. And I think that that has actually um, proven to be what's going on. My apologies. I thought I had all this stuff closed down and it's all bugging me. <laughs> it's, it's all interconnected now, you know. Speaking of technology. Exactly. Speaking of technology, it's going to rear up and bite me. Um, I think that that notion of reaching out to people to find out, you know, first step, reach out and let them know we know you're part of our family. We want you to know what's happening with us. We want you to know where we're struggling, what we hope to deliver. We're gonna make sure you know when we are delivering it and we're gonna you know, follow through on those promises to the best of our ability is step one. I recently read an article that really gave me an interesting insight though, as fundraisers that people, given that this has gone on for so long are going to be in some ways different people. Whether it's now that we're a year into it 
They've had family change circumstances. They've had business change circumstances. They've decided that they need to put their philanthropic investments somewhere else because something about what's happening in the world has attracted their attention and they think that's where they need to invest their philanthropy. And so it, it's one of the things that I am imagining for 2021 and I would love to hear thoughts from this group about is just checking in with our donors without the assumption that they're still ours. You know, checking in the, with them as people just to say, hey, where are you? What's next for you? How are you feeling about things? Has, has there, have there been discussions like that? And are, are, is that taking place? I, sorry, I was out for a little while, but um, yeah, we, we run youth development camp-based programs. And I did have um, somebody who normally gives thousands of dollars and I, I did the friendly check-in email when I didn't get that check. And then at the end of the year, finally I said, you know, are you guys, are you guys not giving out any money? And they said, in fact, we pivoted in 2020. And they said, so we've given that, that money away to somebody else um, and we'll kind of revisit our giving next year. Yeah, anyone else finding uh, shifts in their, their donor affinity, I guess is the way to look at it, you know, where they're putting their interests? We, we've had all sorts of evolutions in our patterns. <laughs> over the past year, um, we've had a number of donors who've told us flat out that they're supporting um, social service organizations. We're at the Brevard Music Center. And, um, you know, we've, we've made it clear to them that um, we support that, um, that we felt that, you know, all organizations need support right now and that um, if that's their choice, then we're, we're behind them 100%. Um, you know, our constituency is, is mostly over the age of 70. So they have gone through a lot in this pandemic and have been very cloistered. And um, so we've had to, and they also don't tend to like technology. So we've had to adapt in some very different ways in terms of um, talking to them. And one of the things that we've been doing um, when the weather is better is um, I've been doing porch picnics on campus where I've invited people individually. They won't do anything in a group. Um, inviting them individually to come and have a picnic with me. They bring their own food. They bring their own utensils. We sit far apart. We visit. We talk whatever. Um, so, you know, all of this is to say that um, it's just been a strange sort of evolution for this time for people making their giving decisions, especially when they're over 70. Mm -hmm. I would and now, agree. They, now they don't want to come out because it's cold. So, <laughs> so we're in like a holding pattern. You know, they don't want to Zoom. They don't want to really talk on the phone. Um, and they don't want to come out when it's cold. Amy, I love what you just said about being okay that your donors had shifted their priorities for a while. I think at times that's appropriate for us as fundraisers to acknowledge that based on what is happening in the world around us, there are going to be organizations who need to help people get food on the table, who need to help pay rent and heating bills. And knowing particularly in this tight-knit community in which we get to work and live, that those organizations will acknowledge that. And when the pendulum swings, they'll feel the same way towards, towards the arts, to education, whatever it may be, and say, you know what, the community stepped up and helped us at a time where we needed it. Let's put our support by making sure that those organizations who were not supported now have the opportunity to be supported. Um, right. I think right. that's one of the things I love most about this community. I will tell you all one of the things that we noticed, and it's interesting to hear you say social services because I'm at the AB Tech Foundation, which of course is higher education. But what we do so often at the foundation is really social services fundraising. We have a robust student emergency fund mm -hmm. that helps buy Ingalls gift cards for folks who need to, you know, have $50 to make ends meet until they get a paycheck. Um, however, we have noticed though that we've experienced a significant number of new scholarship donors 
who have acknowledged that people have lost jobs mm -hmm. and are looking to obtain new training in order to re-enter the workforce. So it's been kind of a twofold for us that our student emergency fund saw a huge surge of giving in March and April and really even throughout the year, but we did have that surge right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but as things have started to shift now, we're seeing our donors come back and say, well, wait a minute, we've got this new company bringing in 800 jobs, you're responsible for training. We wanna make sure that there's opportunities there for folks to attend those courses that they need, as well as making that shift into mm -hmm. potentially new, um, new jobs because they've lost what they've had available to them. Yeah, I, I think the, the piece to remember there is how savvy our donors are. You know, they're philanthropists because they're trying to solve a problem, even if there's membership and entertainment to be consumed or a specific objective to reach like um, an education in a particular field. They, they are strategizing. And this is actually a really dynamic time to try to engage them in, you know, we think this is our new strategy. Does that work with you? Would, you know, I think there's a feedback loop that we could create right now when we're in these one-on-one -on -one phone calls as we move from the, the check-in, because we had that period, to now the collaboration, the how, the how can we how can we work together. There's some good examples, I think, um, of organizations that are doing different things, but um, Mana Food Bank, who, who's been overwhelmed, just totally overwhelmed in the region, but, um, for their the responses they need to make has more than doubled and now is probably more than tripled their fundraising mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time has been able to keep volunteers safely going in and you know helping pack and deliver products but their emails which are sometimes daily do acknowledge other activities and other organizations in the community that they're working with or that they want to highlight for whatever reason. So they, it's a good example if you don't get it just to take a look at. I think it's also nice because especially in a community as small as ours, it shows that they are not, it's a way of not seeming overwhelmed. Um, they are still aware of what else is going around them, engaged with the rest of the community, engaged with the same things that they can anticipate that their audience is engaged with. Um, we have, last year, we had our minds a little blown. We were doing work with the um, Low Country Food Bank in Charleston, South Carolina. And they're one of the top examples for me in 2020 of deciding that they would lean in despite how busy they were and do a substantial amount of um, work in their case, specifically around volunteer recognition because they wanted their volunteers to feel celebrated during this time when they were being asked to do so much more and under some you know, challenging circumstances. They needed to come out of their houses and homes and literally go work at the food bank. And, and that was something to um, be celebrated. I, I do think that it contributed to uh, within the, their donor population. So they do a little bit of you know, separating volunteerism from, from donors as most organizations would. That um, emphasis on the volunteer in 2020 was very well received by their donors. Their donors ended up funding quite a bit of, of the activities that went on, which were facility-based. I mean, we, we rebranded, repainted, did things that, you know, you, I would not have expected a food bank to decide to do in, in 2020, but, but they, they leaned in and they did that. Have any of your organizations actually um, made a decision to do something that might have been backburnered or that was uh, what well, we can't get to that uh, during the 2020 time period? Kelly, I saw you nodding yes. What, what, what was your example of somebody really taking it up a notch instead of having to pull back in 2020? Sure. So one of the organizations that I work with has decided to take the last part of 2020 and all of 2021 because normal operations are going to be shut down. They decided to devote the staff time during that period to working on DEI work. So actually bringing in a consultant and starting the process of all of that internal work so that when normal operations start back up again, that work will have already been internalized by the staff and the board. 
So it's something that the organization would never have had the time to do normally. Right, right. And it puts their, it puts a whole new um, dimension to their mission delivery when they are able to get back in. So that, that's fantastic. Any other examples of things that, you know, whether it's you personally due to work from home, you were able to get to that thing that never would get done or the, uh, the converse, work from home took you away from things. How has work been different for you in the last 12 months, 11 months? One thing that, um, Go ahead. Go ahead. one thing that uh, we um, decided to start doing at Pisca Legal last year, we, you know, we've always done uh, donor thank you calls. And, you know, a lot of times with a cutoff of, you know, donors above a certain amount, we'll, we'll give a thank you call. And knowing that we had a lot less events last year and, you know, a lot of our kind of normal work was um, put on the back burner in the, you know, development team, we actually decided that we would try to uh, give a thank you call to every donor um, that came in and, and recruited a volunteer to do that. And um, that's been, I think, really successful um, because you see the donor who gets a thank you call donate a second time a few months later um, you know, uh, first, first time donors who donate a second time, and then hopefully we'll start to uh, donate, you know, every year. Um, so it's been a lot to keep up with, especially around the year end, um, mm -hmm. you know, in uh, November, December, we're still digging out from, from that, but, you know, I've had a lot of good conversations and have also been able to, uh, fill in some of the, um, details about donors' interests more so, their interests, their personal lives in our system better to then be able to help personalize our communications a little bit more. Um, so that's been a big pivot. And I don't know how that will look once we go back to having more events, but. And did you say that a volunteer was leading the effort, participating? What was the role of a volunteer in that process? Yeah, uh, making a lot of the calls. Um, so we segment them by amount um, with the higher uh, amount calls being made by our, our staff and, and development director, executive director, but um, so almost all of the lower amount um, calls being made by a volunteer who hasn't burned out yet. Which is amazing. That yeah. volunteer is probably all full of good feeling. That's, that's amazing. Yep. That's fantastic. Any other examples? We, um, hi, I'm Nikki um, Harris and I work for Planned Parenthood South Atlantic. Um, we, you know, COVID really forced us to change our business model, which was pretty scary. Initially, um, we had to pivot quickly to doing telehealth, which we didn't necessarily have the infrastructure to do, um, but our team was able to get it up and running. And so that's been a great thing to share with donors because, you know, instead of all patients having to come to us, we can kind of meet people where they are. And not every appointment requires an in-person um, visit. So that's been great. And that's not going anywhere. Um, you know, I think we can continue to, to, to serve people, whether they're in Madison County or, you know, Cherokee County without them physically having to be there. Um, and that was something that I think was really great to be able to share with donors. Um, as far as doing something a little bit differently, um, a lot of folks have iPhones and I'm a big fan of FaceTime as opposed to a Zoom call. There's something about it that feels like, hey, I can sit outside and talk to a donor. Um, and then um, folks have been pretty receptive to that. And I'll say too, um, it, you know, people can only get so many thank you notes, I feel like, um, especially if they're, um, you know, not really communicating with us. One thing that I found to be really helpful in getting a good response um, from donors is that we had our health center manager um, record a special video message for donors. And, um, you know, if people, if I knew that people didn't really check emails because, you know, it's people are overloaded, I would text it to them or, you know, send it to them via email. And that, that was really, uh, I think a great way to kind of spice it up a little bit. 
I think it not only spices it up, but when you think about it from the donor's perspective, they love their fundraiser friend. You know, they know that person, but they also know what that communication is about. Most often it's either thank you or cultivation and they're smart, they know that. But I think when we can bring them subject matter experts, that really <laughs> takes it up a level of we're involving you in the cause, in the mission delivery piece. So that, that to me, that's a really smart move is to, to give them information through a different channel. You know, they're getting it from a different person. Absolutely. Well, uh, yes, I would agree with that. So thank you. All right. Well, I we've got about 10 minutes left and I've got a cup. I've got just one more major chunk here. And then Kathy's going to ask a few of the questions that came in through your survey and see if that helps us converse a little bit more. But the question that I would add uh, that was the last of the questions we asked our survey people is what comes next? And as I said, at that point, most of them didn't know. And my question for you all is, you know, here we sit first quarter, we'd all be planning whether we were on fiscal year or calendar year, this would just inherently, what's gonna happen when the weather gets warmer, what's gonna happen when the season starts, what is going to come, come next for us all? Um, we can't know for sure. So it seems a little crass to ask, but if we don't start to plan, and we don't start to build on the experience that we gained in the past 11 months, what are we gonna plan out for the next 11 months? So I, before we you know, call it to a close, I'm wondering if anyone can put out something that they learned, whether it was personally or as a member of your team or as a, as a learner of all new ways, anything that really is, is resonating with you as something that is different and you're thankful for it and you're gonna you're gonna grow on that. Anything come to mind? Well, I can start. Um, for me, I lead a team of six and in my little heart of hearts, I had always known that I would like to work remotely, like really remotely, like what would happen if I went to another state? What would happen if I um, only came into the office two days a month? But I thought that was such a pipe dream that I couldn't achieve it. And I always imagined it as everyone else was still in the office, but I left. But instead, 2020 brought me the opportunity to see what happened when I stayed at the office and they all left. And at first that was traumatic for me and I didn't like it, but now I've realized they all have similar dreams. Um, Kathy refers to it as her, her pandemic moment. Uh, many of you may not know this, but Kathy's being called to Dallas, Texas. So now my team is much freer to, to scatter and to spread. And instead of just me getting my dream and they all stay in one place, I get to be thankful for the fact that we're all getting our dreams and yet we can still stay as a team. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. And I, I'm wondering, um, Anything, Wendy Lou, I, there's one thing I could call on you because you brought it up in our conversation getting ready for this. Um, we were talking about the transition to the technology and Wendy Lou's our technologist. So anything that I need or know or don't know or turn to Wendy Lou. And you brought up that whole notion of the terms of engagement for social interactions as we make this change. Could you talk a little bit about your history and about what you're seeing around terms of engagement moving forward? Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, the rules of engagement when we meet each other in person, well, that's pretty much like what we've been trained for our whole lives because we have been very much face to face in person people. Um, and then um, I remember that my first little dose of uh, this kind of environment was working with Twestable and Twestable Global um, back in the early aughts. Um, and working with people all over the globe that you, there's no way that you could work together. So in the early days of Google Wave <laughs> and Google Teams and other things, um, it was fascinating to see like, because it was all social media people that were pulled in to fundraise um, locally and for larger global nonprofits. Um, so that's where I first started to see like the wobbly legs of this um, start. And I have always wanted to, to be able to work remotely even if working remotely, um, you know, had to be forced during a pandemic, not my choice, would, would much <laughs> rather have had it happen a different way. But it's very exciting to me um, 
to see how well not only our how our team has done so well and really refined the tools that we use but also to watch those responses come in on the thanking donors because I, I I sign up for like whenever a response comes in I want to read it right away <laughs> um, but to see how many people are like wow I thought this was going to be ridiculously hard and whatnot but you know I'm actually doing all right with this um, and the only thing for me is like I would like to see some more refinement around the tools like you know they've got the hand raise and you can physically raise your hand and you know knowing when to come in and this this whole environment here where it's like you know um, Hollywood Squares is what it reminds me of. Um, and the thing is with like Zoom, like I don't know if y'all if have noticed, but like it moves people around. Um, I would really love to like, you know, maybe as we're going, as we're growing and this experience is changing, I would love to see more rules of engagement. Like, you know, you know, perhaps like we all have like like a little like you know like hold up a red square if you have uh if you have a comment on this topic or whatever anyway that's a ridiculous example but um i think as uh we start to and i always give google hangouts my full feedback when i ask at the end of a call um i think as we have more people participating and engaging in this kind of environment um I think that we're going to, just like we did from little kids, learn how to adapt and use the new rules of engagement here. Um, but I have been super proud of the way uh, to work on a team that so quickly pivoted to this environment um, really well and doesn't mind my, you know, constantly coming over to Google chat to say, hey, what about this? It's like me popping into your office, but virtually. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it, and as an extrovert, it's not like it hasn't been trying. Um, and I think that a lot of my fellow extrovert, I don't know if any of you in here consider yourselves extroverts, but how, uh, <laughs> I've been talking to my plants. I think that's why they're doing so well. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's definitely been, it's been a huge shift, but it, it's really cool to see, um, you know, like even my mom and being able to communicate with me on a Google document and whatnot, I'm like, oh, well, see, we can all do this. This is fabulous. Um, but yeah, so rules of engagement. I, I would like to see, I would like to see a little more like, when do I step in, you know, that kind of thing. But already this feels better than the things that we did uh, six months ago. So yeah, it's happening. Anyone else have like a, a win they're going to build on? I think it's just fascinating to watch. You know, um, I studied anthropology, so I use the word evolution a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, um, you know, we all know that our future lies in the hands of all these youngsters who are, who are, um, behind us and making great changes and buying um, GameStop stocks right now and, uh, you know, putting it, sticking it to the man. So, um, you know, we have to listen to them and we have to learn from them and we have to adopt their, um, their technologies and, 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 I think that this uh, move to work remotely is here to stay. And, you know, there's going to be some resistance to it, but um, I think that, I think this is one of the silver linings that has come out of COVID that we're going to have, that our relationship with our own lives has changed. Mm -hmm. And um, we got to get with the program. Yeah. Ben, earlier you mentioned the opportunity to like have more donors participate in an event than you know you might have otherwise. That's been across the board a uh, uptick in the uh, use of technology to bring donors and others together. Is that nobody has to travel? You don't really have to change clothes much. You drink your own coffee. Like it, it has facilitated whether it's telehealth or 
board meeting attendance or donor luncheon, suddenly we can think about it in a new and much easier way to accomplish. I mean, one of the um, things as we went into 2019, I had a new client and it's a Catholic monastery. And I was just told outright, you will never be inside the monastery. Wow. Email, that's not how that's going to work. Well, now I get to meet with them on Zoom calls and I'm not just in the monastery, I'm in their rooms. And it's like, they don't see that. I don't point it out to them because I like that. I like seeing him, the monk in his shorts with the cat in his lap. And, but it's just such a shift in, um, like Wendy Lou said, the rules of engagement aren't there. And so some of the formality is gone and we're able to have much more real conversations with one another. And in some ways there's, you know, we need to be careful with access to other people in ways that we don't want. We need to be careful about, you know, pirating. I mean, like there was a, a nonprofit that had a horrible situation early in the situation in the spring of last year where their call was hijacked and horrible racial things happened in the middle of a call not unlike this one. So there's a lot of things we have to be careful of, but we can't be afraid of. I think this is our new reality and, and it's, it's how we're going to um, actually achieve more than we ever thought, not lose everything we thought we had. Yep. So we are now up to one minute. So I'm gonna let Kathy at least sum this up because I didn't let her ask any of your questions. <laughs> That's so funny. I mean, you guys were so great um, just to, to share everything with us. And this has turned out to be exactly what, what we had hoped it to be. Um, yesterday, when Ann and I and Wendy Lou were talking about the presentation, I made a comment. Um, one of the questions on the survey that we sent to you guys is, you know, really kind of how's your team? Um, and my favorite answer that I got back was meh. <laughs> so it was somebody that was like, you know, the team is just the team. And most of the responses that we got back were, we're okay, but we're tired. Um, we, we've been through this and um, we've made it through it. And I think one of the, one of the things that I just want to ask, um, and maybe you just need to ask yourself this is, First of all, how's your team and how are you managing through this? But the most important thing I think is, how are you celebrating the fact that you're still standing? I mean, there are a lot of folks who aren't still standing. And clearly the work that you guys have done um, has not only benefited you, but all of those around you. So I would really urge you all to celebrate um, and do that with your teams, whatever form that takes. So I think that's it. Anybody comment? Anybody doing anything great to celebrate? And if not, I want to hear about what you're going to do. <laughs> we, um, we've been having a check-in with our group every month. We always have meet monthly meetings, but we've been putting more emphasis on the social part of it. And just everybody's been checking in about just where they're at at the beginning of every meeting. And the, what I've been told the best thing is that we've done is um, uh, most of us have animals. And so we had a, a pet uh, sharing day, bring your pet to the meeting day, um, which some of the animals cooperated and some of them didn't. Um, but, um, but so we've been kind of just doing some sort of fun things and trying to just and put a little more, more emphasis on the social and just a supportive part of it. Um, as opposed to more of the business stuff that we would tend to do. I thought I'd share the pet thing because that was fun. That's a great one. Yeah. yeah. I brought my pet today, but you might not have seen her. I mean, she she was in the picture for a little while. She jumps on this, the keyboard if you don't pick her up. <laughs> She's been on a lot of Zoom calls. I think the um, cats a knowledge of why are they talking to that flat glass thing I would love to be able to know how they know to just get between you and the glass stop that you're talking to a picture frame that doesn't make any sense Cass I think they're talking. absorbing everything that that is on our meeting in our meetings and on our zooms 
<laughs> oh, you got a new comic strip right there. That could be great. <laughs> no, my cat's not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> you think? No, I know. I know she's not. <laughs> Well, thank you all for spending this time with us today and uh, for speaking up, because I know sometimes these calls are, um, we, we come to it with the rules of engagement, but it's to listen. And I really wanted us to have a conversation. So thank you all for joining us in that. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Kathy. If I could just say a couple of words to wrap us up. This was great. Thanks, Wendy Lou. Um, thanks, everybody, for your participation, as Anne was saying. This was, this was a very helpful discussion, invigorating. Um, I just want to say that we do have uh, <coughs> professional development sessions scheduled on our normal Wednesday, February 17th, and it's with uh, Cheryl Aikman, who's going to be talking about planned giving. She's got a wealth of experience there, so whether you're a planned giving expert or looking to, to begin developing your knowledge, that's a great session for you. And also thanks everybody, presenters and attendees alike. We rescheduled this from Inauguration Day. And I, I really appreciate everybody making time and rolling with the, the scheduling change. Fortunately, Inauguration Day was less eventful than we've, we may have feared, um, but I'm still glad we were able to find a new time and, and this was more productive and we were more focused than we would have been on January 20th. So with that, I'm, I'm happy for the, the, the conversation to continue, but I just wanted to say those few words before we wrapped up. Thanks everybody. Bye, right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Anne and Kathy and Wendy Lou, thank you guys so much. This was wonderful. Thanks. You're very welcome. It was yes. great. Welcome. We enjoyed it very much. Thanks so much for reaching out. I know Kathy, you, you first you first uh, touched base quite a while ago, and it took us some time to to find the right moment. So it worked glad. out great. What a great group. It is a great group. I'm glad you all were willing to do this, and and hopefully we can do something else in the future. Thank you. I hope to see you soon. Likewise. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. bye, -bye.